Welcome to the Apostolic Center podcast. We're so glad you could join us. We have Harrison with us tonight taking pictures. He doesn't have a mic. Um, we have Patrick with us. How you doing, Patrick? Hey, how's it going? Going good. And then we have Brother Shelton. How are you doing, Brother Shelton? I'm good. Why don't you uh, tell us a little bit about yourself before we begin? Well, there's not a whole lot <laughs> to tell. Um, How long have you been preaching? Uh, 34 years. And how many kids you got? I have three kids. What are the ages? They're all pretty young, aren't they? Malachi will be five, uh, six in March, and the girls are both 12. They'll be teenagers in September and October. Are you oh, ready man. for that? They're keeping you on your feet? No, I am not ready for that, <laughs> and yes, they keep us on our feet. <laughs> but at 54, uh, if you're surrounded by young people, you stay young. You stay young, yep. yeah. So... Uh, if it wasn't for young kids, I, I'd be bored most of the time. So, <laughs> I kind of want to start with, I know you've pastored before, and now you, you preach out mainly. W- what are kind of some of the differences between those? Uh, pastoring, you you can't escape. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know what? I enjoy pastoral ministry, really, in in some facets of it. Because in pastoring... Um, you you do at least get to be there to see people's lives change. Traveling all the time, you you never get to see anything finished. Um, really, though, even in pastoral ministry, you don't see the process ever finished because about the time you get one thing finished, there's somebody else that's going through something. You get them through what they're going through, and there's something else. And so, but... With pastoral ministry, you do get to see more of the continual process of people becoming everything God's called them to be, doing what God's called them to be. And you get to be there to impart and teach and train and lead them to the place that they step into whatever their ministry calling is. Uh, On the traveling side of it, you don't necessarily get to do that unless you're able to go back repetitively to some places Mm -hmm. with some regularity at least then you do get to see the growth in a person um and and that's that's always fulfilling and it makes what you do in ministry a whole lot better or more fulfilling and satisfying to see not that we're here to make a difference in people's lives that's up to them and god but to see your involvement with people and watch how God takes that and watch what they do with that and see the transformation process. That's always, it's encouraging because there's so much about, you know, it's like a guy told me one time, he said, you need to own enough grass that you can mow grass. I said, why? He said, because you can at least finish something (laughs) in the ministry. You never get to finish. Yeah. But the good thing about traveling, um, you get to go home and shut the front door right? and you're home. And that ministry typically does not infiltrate home. Pastoral ministry is 24-7, 365 days a year. And even though my family's involved in what I do now, pastors' families have a involvement that nobody else's families have. And so... Those are some of the some of the varied comparisons. Yeah, I think you've said it here before, and in my research, I heard you say this. Um, and I think it's something that a lot of pastors deal with. Uh, you said that you spend most of your time dealing with people who don't really want to change. Um, you know, where where did that kind of click for you when you finally got that revelation of I need to start investing in people who want to be in ministry and do the work of the kingdom? Uh, later than I wish it would have. I think if um, I think if somebody would have told me on the front end of ministry, be able to discern the group of people that you're involved with that want to grow from the ones you're involved with that don't want to grow, and I did, I I I just blew past all that, and I I tried to develop potential. And 
it is my opinion, and it's just my opinion. Um, that was one of the most futile efforts I've ever involved myself with because a lot of times potential resides within someone who doesn't really care to develop it. They don't want to be the best they can be at this or that. They they don't see the value that you see in their ministry or they just don't want to be involved. And so it becomes like a – it becomes a personal challenge. Mm-hmm. Now I'm going to convert you. I'm going to convince you that you do want to be involved in ministry and you do want to change and whatever. And the ones that actually – and you're still not going to change them. But the ones that would have changed and the ones who wanted to do something different, I got to realizing I had let them sit on the sidelines and just all but starve to death. And so I think our job in the ministry is to develop people, giftings, and not worry about potential. That's between them and the Lord, and if they don't want it developed, then there's nothing you can do about it. But the ones who say, here I am, help me, lead me, train me, teach me, man, those are the ones that you pour into, and the kingdom is better off because of it. Some of your mentors, someone that you talk about very often is T.W. Barnes. Um, You know, he was obviously way before my time. I've seen some YouTube uh, videos and stuff like that. How did that relationship come about between you two? It's really a weird story. I I had all my life I knew there was something different about me. Now I I, I nobody nobody talked to me about it as a kid. I grew up in a very good church, a solid church. It was a word church. But nobody ever took time to talk to me about the gifts of the Spirit. I don't remember really ever hearing a whole lot being said about the five-fold ministry um, as a child and as a young person growing up in the church. So I'd had the Holy Ghost since I was about nine, and all of this stuff that God has developed into whatever it is today, it's been there my whole life. And I I didn't know what to do with it. I thought something was wrong with me. And so <clears throat> I know now that it was the Lord revealing stuff and showing stuff to me, even as a 13, 14, 15-year-old kid. So a very good friend of mine uh, knew Brother Barnes, and he called. I, we were talking one day, and he said, I, I'm going to call Brother Barnes and get you an appointment with him because I don't know how to – I don't know who else to point you in the direction of, and I don't know how to help you develop whatever this is. And so he called Brother Barnes, and when I walked in, uh, Brother Barnes' first statement to me was, as he shook my hand, I've been waiting on you. And I thought, (laughs) as a matter of fact, I said it out loud. I said, what do you mean waiting on me? He said, the Lord told me someone was coming and that I was going to help him and said a few other things. And so as a result of that, for the next 13 to 13 and a half years, I went to see him. Sometimes it would be every week. Sometimes it might be once a month. Uh, I don't remember it ever really going more than a month. Sometimes he called me. Sometimes I called him. There were times I might would have a dream about him on Monday night, and Tuesday morning he would call, and in his own way, he would say, all right, the Lord told me you had a dream about me last night. (laughs) Be here Thursday morning, 9 a.m., and we'll talk. And I only, in all those years, I only, it was crazy, and I don't know if he did it on purpose or if it just happened, but I never met him any day other than Thursday morning at 9 (laughs) o'clock. (laughs) <laughs> and so my tutelage with him began that way. And I think the longest conversation I had with him was about five hours. The shortest conversation I had with him was about five minutes. And um, each conversation was unique. I never took a note. Uh, my bishop kind of gets a little 
<laughs> hard on me every now and then. He's like, I cannot believe you didn't record or take notes or nothing. But I always felt like if I had of, it would have, I just was afraid it would interrupt whatever the flow was that was there. So mm -hmm. sure. now all these years later, you, it, it's, you don't think about stuff and try to keep it in your mind. You try to keep it in your spirit. And then when the Lord needs it or wants it, he brings it to the surface and there it is. But that's how that all happened. Yeah. So you were saying when you were younger, some things you had to develop, what, what was kind of going on with you? Oh man, <laughs> at the risk of sounding like a weirdo, <laughs> uh, I, I've, I would know when the phone was going to ring. Mm -hmm. Um, I would, we, I remember sitting at the kitchen table and <clears throat> Or at our dining room table and eating a meal with our family and and all of a sudden I could see our pastor coming across the railroad tracks down the road and turning onto our street and I'd tell my uh, parents uh, pastors coming and they were always like Scott you're just what are you talking and sure enough in about two minutes he'd be pulling up in the driveway Wow uh, phone ring mm -hmm. i'd just go stand by the phone i'd get up and just walk stand by the phone and reach for it just as it would start to ring and i i couldn't figure it out um i i it was like if i if i got around people i had to just really kind of guard myself because it was easy to pick up on stuff and as a result of that i really will admit i felt like i was I really thought I was losing my mind because mm -hmm. nobody had ever talked to me about uh, being spiritually sensitive. Nobody had ever talked to me about uh, discernment, um, nothing. And so, you know, when you're when you're around people, and then I'd notice I would people would come and be wanting to ask a question, and I'd just answer it before they'd ask it. Mm -hmm. uh, and so it was stuff like that that I and it got to a point that I couldn't. I didn't know how to shut it off. Then I had this fear that, well, if I ever really shut this stuff off, I may lose it. Hmm. And so now you're thrown into this thought process of, well, I've got to walk around really serious, really somber, and uh, just focus in on everything. And so I really had reached a point in my early 20s that I, I just – it was it was to the point, like if somebody was going to give me a birthday present, uh, I knew what I knew what they were going to buy me. I, I, I to look at, to see a box sitting under a Christmas tree. It got to the point that it wasn't hard to know what was in them. And so, uh, Brother Barnes' statement was, "If you'll let me help you," this is one of the things he said that day. He said, "If you'll let me help you." I can keep you from having the same uh, breakdown that I had because he, he said that when he was a young man, he didn't have anybody there to teach him either. And that, that sensitivity was just so raw that it just, you pick up on everything. And so on one hand you think, well, wouldn't that be kind of neat? But on the other hand, it's not because you, you've got your, the human mind because of what Adam did we, we no longer have the ability in our flesh to just live there 24 seven. Right. <clears throat> You've got to be sensitive 24 seven, but it's not, I don't think the will of God for us to know everything 24 hours a day because the human brain and body can't can handle that and can't contain all of that. So you, you end up in a situation where if you're not careful, you'll have a mental breakdown or a nervous breakdown. And you've got to know how to let that gift operate and let the Lord speak stuff to you as opposed to you just trying to run out there and discern everything in the room. And so he he laid hands on me that day. And he said, I, I'm going to cause that gifting to go dormant until I can teach you how to operate it and to let it operate in you really. And um, when you're able to deal with it and you're able to handle it, then I'll lay hands on you again and release that gift. And, man, i got to tell you, um, when that happened, there was some trepidation because I thought, well, 
what if I don't get it back? Right. But <clears throat> the peace that I had, um, and one of the statements that he made to me so many times in all of that was, God is not a peeping Tom. Just because you can see and you can know doesn't mean it's the will of God for you to see and know anything other than what he wants you to see and know. So that was, um, wasn't just tutelage. I mean, it, it saved my life. Right. It, it caused me to have some boundaries that I would have never had otherwise. What kind of man was he? I mean, you were obviously real close <clears throat> to him. I mean, what, what are some of the things that stick out to you? Like I said, I mean, we see him from afar. I mean, we don't, we don't know him like you do. <clears throat> sure. Brother Barnes was one of the most down-to-earth, simple people. He wore zip ties a lot. Um, <laughs> I, I just couldn't believe it when I first realized, I, and I never saw him in anything other than a suit. Mm-hmm. Uh, he would wear overalls uh, and, and a, usually a long sleeve flannel shirt or some pattern like that, but uh, or a white shirt and a tie um, and, a, and a suit coat over it if he felt like it. Um, he wore zip ties, little old polyester suits and shirts. And I say polyester, they look like polyester to me, but I only saw him in three different colors of suits. Now he may have had more. Mm -hmm. I just saw him in black, gray, and mauve, kind of a mauve champagne color and had his little zip ties on. And his socks were always, every time I went over there, uh, just about 100% of the time, he never had his shoes on. And he would (laughs) always lean back in his chair Mm -hmm. and cross his feet at the ankle and on the corner of his desk. And um, if you go see a prophet, you always take him an offering and uh, a peace offering. And he loved, <laughs> he loved ice cold Dr. Pepper. <laughs> well, there was a gas station just a half a mile from the church that had a refrigerator that was the coldest refrigerator I'd ever seen in a convenience store. So I'd always stop and get him a ice cold Dr. Pepper, and he'd crack that thing open and just kind of giggle a little bit as it would ice up, and he'd drink on it. Mm. And... Um, it did not prevent me from getting shellacked every now and then. If I had it coming, he sure put it on me. But I think it may have bought me a little mercy, taking yeah. a little peace <laughs> offer. But he was uncomplicated. He uh, <clears throat> he said one day he went to his shelf to get a book. And he said he had put his finger on the spine of that book and was about to pull it out of the shelf. And he said the Lord spoke to him and said, Tom, what you doing, boy? <laughs> That's how he talked. <laughs> and he told the Lord, he said, well, I'm reading this book. Well, why? Well, this particular subject I saw in Scripture, and I remember this guy wrote about it. He said, well, is, uh, is that the book I wrote? He said, no. So you're going to read a book written by somebody else to explain the book I wrote. And he said, he just shoved that book back up said, no, sir, I'm not. <laughs> he said, you go back and spend time with me, and I'll explain my book to you. And so he said to me that was the last day that he went that route to learn the things of God. He said, I spent the rest of my life in the Word of God, and that's not necessarily reading other people's stuff. Because he figured out early on, apparently, that he didn't want to know more about God He wanted to know God. And you can read what others have written, and if that's all you read, you'll have a wealth of information about him and never really know him. And so he was just, he was uncomplicated. He had him a little farm outside town, had some cows out there, and he and Sister Barnes would go out, he said, and sit under the the tree and just watch his cows, maybe take some iced tea with them or something. Mm -hmm. Um, Real low-key. Yeah, low keyed and uncomplicated. Yeah, I heard you talk about um, spiritual impartation and how it's not really talked about or done much these days. Why do you think that is? 
Uh, I think there are a lot of spiritual practices that are not done today for the same reason. The scripture says that Moses led Joshua and Joshua was right there with him. When Moses died, the Lord told Moses, though, he said, you bless Joshua, you give him your blessing, you bless him. Then the Lord stands on on the scene and says, as I was with my servant Moses, so shall I also be with you. Talking about Joshua. Then the scripture says, so there was impartation there. That was impartation. Give him your blessing. So <clears throat> there was a spiritual transference. And now Joshua is in, I'll use the term possession of, but now Joshua has available to him everything that Moses had available to him. And the Lord then says, as I was with Moses, I'm going to be that, that same relationship with you. But something happened at that point in the leadership of Israel. Joshua led them correctly. But the scripture says that after Joshua died, the children, the, the elders that, that worked under him and, and were working with him, the elders continued to lead Israel. But then they died, and there then arose a generation which knew not God. Hmm. They learned the semantics of the kingdom. They learned the academics of the kingdom. They learned the procedures of the kingdom. But that spiritual conveyance and that spiritual impartation, somewhere after Joshua got it, that I don't think that there was just a, a full-blown realization of how necessary it was to put your hand on someone and say, such as I have, give I thee. The same as with Elijah and Elisha. Elijah is taken up in a whirlwind, and he says to Elisha, if you see me when I'm taken, um, you'll have what you want, a double portion of his spirit. I want a double portion of what you are. So he sees him taken up. The mantle falls. He picks it up, puts it on, and... <clears throat> Then when Elisha is on his deathbed, he tells the king, come in the room with me, strike the ground. And the last emotion Elisha had as he died, the scripture says he was wroth. He was mad at the king because the king had only struck the ground three times. Okay, well, in the, what was it, three years that Elisha traveled with Elijah before Elijah was taken away? There was something imparted in there. There, there were nights sitting by the campfire. There was He was standing right beside the man of God when ministry was being done, whatever the case. And there, was, there were things that were, that were imparted to him spiritually, intellectually, conversationally, visually. But somewhere, Joshua didn't have that same relationship with the leaders under him, and Elisha didn't have that same relationship with the king. I wonder how many times the king would have struck the ground if there had been a relationship of impartation. <clears throat> and so, which again, Elijah had a school of prophets, but he faced the prophets of Baal alone. Hmm. Where were they at? Right. Where was the impartation? Where was the connection? I like to see men of God when the pastor's moving through the building praying for people, especially young men uh, who are still developing their ministries and finding what it is God's called them to be, but really not just limited to them. F walk with the pastor. If the man of God's walking along praying for people, don't get, you know, don't, don't necessarily get up there and try to hear every word he's saying because it might be private. But be in that proximity because there's something supernatural going on, and I want that to wash over me. But you've got to be there. If you're not there, it's not coming. And so I think that it's just one of those deals that we've taken for granted. We don't see the need for it. And I'm a broke record, I guess, from last night to today. But we're so good at having church. By the time the four Gospels were written, Jesus was in the street. And they're having the Passover feast in regards to him. Right. But they never even invite him in the room. He was there, and they didn't have a clue how significant it would have been to have had him in the room with them. And I think a lot of times now we are, this would get me in trouble, but we would prefer to ship people off to Bible college mm -hmm. 
where they can be taught the academics of ministry, the hermeneutics and the homiletics, but they wouldn't know a move of God if it slapped them right in the mouth. And if if a young man's got an apostolic call on his life to the fivefold ministry, then in my opinion, connect him to somebody that's an elder that has that same calling. Um, give them access to one another where there can be some training and tutelage and impartation. Um, but for goodness sake, don't just ship them off to a mass production facility and cookie cut and, and rubber stamp everybody and send everybody out the door looking, sounding, and acting just exactly the same when everyone there is uniquely different. And so I think I think it's just one of those deals. It's it's labor intensive. You got to pay attention. You got to selfless people impart things. Selfish people don't. All right. Yeah. I'm sorry. I'm giving long answers to short questions. No, they're no, great answers. That's what we want. Um, I think I heard you talk. This must have been two years ago. And if I'm wrong, correct me. I think Brother Barnes told you or gave you a mandate that you're supposed to minister to the to youth age people is that am i right on that he told me that there would be a lot of a lot of what i was doing would be focused in younger people in that direction when did he tell you that was that early on when you guys Uh, started talking or later multiple times throughout our relationship uh but primarily the last time he told me was just within a couple of months before he passed. I was actually in uh, Illinois uh, preaching for Brother Lashley. Um, and we were in the car one day, and the Lord spoke to me. He said, call Brother Barnes. And so I just picked my phone up and called him, and my hand to God, the phone rings. He did not have caller ID. The phone rings, and he said, all right, boy. <laughs> I was waiting on you to call me. Told the Lord I need to talk to you. I said, yes, sir. He said, when can you be here? I said, well, um, he swore yet, I told him. He said, well, I need to talk to you. I said, I'll be there th- I'll be there Thursday. When you want me? He said, Thursday. I said, I'll be there. So I preached that night, got in my vehicle on Wednesday morning, drove to Louisiana. And so in the course of that conversation, he told me, he said, there will come a day when men that God has given visibility to and influence to, they are going to take that influence and visibility and be consumed with building their own kingdoms and their own churches and their own ministries. And he said, and of course his fingers looked like they were 17 inches long, but (laughs) he said, the Lord's going to be going along like this and then he's going to turn Going to make a 90-degree turn, boy, and then he's going to be going that direction in the end time. He said, and when he makes that turn, those men that are consumed with themselves and their ministries and not the kingdom are not even going to know he's made the turn. My God. And And this is what he said to me. He will never send anybody back to get them. He said, now, some of them will realize something happened after the fact and will will begin to gravitate that direction and try to catch up, and they will. But he said most of them will never know that he's moved in a whole different direction. And he said when that time comes and the Lord makes that turn, and I personally believe the Lord's already made that turn, he said the Lord's going to move across the land, and I want you to keep your eyes open. He said, the Lord is going to bring young men and women to the surface. That was the way he put it. These are people that have been obscure. They were faithful. They were hidden. They were tucked away. They were happy where they were. They would have followed whoever else was leading. They didn't want a leadership position. They were, they were f- content and faithful and content to be faithful. But when these men are left... The Lord is going to be like a magnet moving across the land and it's going to cause these to come out of obscurity. And these will be the apostles, prophets, pastors, teachers, and evangelists that he turns the world upside down with in the end time. And so he, you know, he, he talked to me multiple times throughout our time about staying, staying tuned into 
and allow God to use me to influence uh, younger people. And, of course, now when you're 90 years old, anybody under 60 is young. <laughs> but I think it would, you know, in his mind, I think he was looking at around 45 or so mm-hmm. and down. Sweet, I'm considered young still. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> I, however, have crossed that threshold where I am not. So how many people do you kind of take under your wing then? I mean. Uh, you yeah. know what? Four. My wife and my three kids. <laughs> there you go. Uh, you know what? I, those are the ones that I pay the closest attention to. Mm-hmm. Um. Outside of that, there's various times of the year we may have 45 people in our house, and and it be husbands and wives, and they're preachers, some of them pastors, some traveling full time, some teachers, just the whole fivefold ministry. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't really know. Um, so it's not necessarily a one on one thing. It's just kind of there are times it is. Um, there are times that I'll have, uh, I've got two or three right now that are wanting to come and just spend a couple of days. Mm -hmm. Uh, and that's always, that's been that way for a long time. Um, we started doing a meeting in Fort Smith about seven years ago. We call it pursuit just, but I, I started it reluctantly, uh, because I always felt like somebody else would be better off doing it, you know? But I kept getting phone calls from these young men, and and they'd say, "Brother Shelton, can we come to your house? I want to come get a hotel, and I'll I'll come to your house for a couple of days, but I'll stay at a hotel if you'll just talk to me." And all that started back when we had all that, all those guys that decided they were going to be emergent and relevant, and we just saw this great, seemed like a vacuum just hit the church and so many guys just went out from us what happened there yeah i I was gonna kind of bring that up eventually but it's in the topic i there were several of them that got caught up in all that that called me and i never i never tried to see their point of view and that sounds harsh but i'm convinced of the truth so i'm not interested in listening to somebody else's twisted view of the truth right yeah now, if you've got questions about the truth, I'll I'll see what see if I can answer them for you, or point you in the right direction. But I I never I never gave them the latitude to just call me and tell me what all they thought was wrong with us. Uh, if you've got questions, I'll answer them. But when I started asking questions, there were there was a group of five guys that did not know each other that called me all the time that got caught up in that. And I ask each and every one of them, what happened? How did you get caught up in all of this? And every one of them, every single one of them said to me, we went to elders and now somebody gets mad about this. Don't be mad at me. I'm just repeating what they told me. (laughs) Yep. They said, we went to elders in our life and ask them questions about spiritual ministry, the gifts of the Spirit, five-fold ministry. How do you do deliverance ministry, if you want to use that term, uh, casting the devil out of somebody, um, somebody that's bound by nicotine or pornography or lying or whatever. They're not necessarily possessed, but they are bound, demonically controlled. How do you get them delivered? And, and those kinds of questions. And What do you do when you see an angel in the room or if you feel something demonic in the room? And when they went to their elders and asked those questions, they said to me, we were always told, you don't need to worry about all that. You just pray and you just study and you put good messages together. You get you some good sermons together. That's your job. And when you go somewhere to preach, you don't go in there to pastor that church. And I understand semantically i understand where they're coming from on that right however a word from god is a word from god and right. and if you want to say i'm trying to pastor your people then i'm sorry you feel that way but if the lord tells me to come in and speak xyz that's exactly what i'm going to do well these guys had done that and kept getting rebuked 
They were obeying God. Some of them were prophets that God sent somewhere with a word for a church that was going to save somebody's soul. But they got hammered for doing it. And so there was just this general consensus. You just get you some good sermons and don't go to the pulpit without your notes. You always have notes, which that's fine. Um, But by the same token, that may be just something you use as a reference, but let the Lord speak through you. Um, don't treat it like a script, I guess is what I'm saying. Right. And they were having spiritual encounters, man. They were, they were praying into places that nobody had ever prayed them through to before. And so when they inquired, what do I do with all this? They're told, you don't need to worry about that. Keep it here. Don't go deep. Keep it right here. And you just get you some good messages and you'll get a lot of referrals and you'll, you'll travel and be successful. Well, some of them bought into that and quit pursuing God and quit being hungry. Some of them didn't. They said to me, we left because the only people that would talk to us were the ones out there. Ones that had never had truth, uh, but were walking in what they did know, or ones that had had truth and walked away from it. Nobody would talk to us except them. And so... That was when the Lord began to really grill me pretty heavy uh, about making myself available. Answer the phone. Let them come. We're putting an addition on our house, and, and the primary reason for that is ministry, uh, to be able to accommodate that. And so... I mean, isn't that what spiritual warfare is? I mean, how, how do you how do you as an elder or a pastor tell someone that and get around that scripture? Well, they don't want to know that scripture, and the elders oftentimes that avoid it avoid it because again, it's it's a labor and that's the only way I know to put it. It's labor. And it's you you're going to have to be involved at a level of selflessness and sacrifice that a lot of men are uncomfortable with. Mm. They build a church to a point that they've got enough money to live a good life, and they're gonna they're content to marry and bury. Pray a few people through here and there, bring an evangelist in two or three times a year, have big revivals with these guys that are quote unquote harvesters, and then that satisfies the 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 realization that we need harvest and we need growth. So I'll hire you to come in and do that, uh, and then I'll see you down the road and we'll do this again in six months or something well isn't that why there's just no growth yes i mean absolutely because you you have someone come in do that and then they don't disciple them anymore exactly it's like fasting to say you fasted sure if fasting does not change your lifestyle you did it for the wrong reason if i'm a glutton on my last day eating before my fast starts and then I go right back to gluttony the first day of eating after my fast ended nothing changed mm. I was I was heightened in spiritual sensitivity for a short few days in the middle of that fast right in the middle because the first few days of it your your body's fatiguing and adjusting to it and the last few days of it your brain's thinking about only what you're going to eat and there's another struggle you're trying to, but it's right there in the middle where there's more continuity and the Lord speaks to you more. And so, yeah, it's, it's the same exact thing. If, if, if what we do in our churches doesn't change the church and grow the church, and again, church growth is not all numeric. Some of it is spiritual growth and depth. Could it also be their appealing <clears throat> to the world trying to you know get the uh, applause of men Mm -hmm. not be the outsiders or people who do stuff differently or yes because there are two types of anointing the one you get from the people and the one you get from god and you know the story of saul he crossed the line he shouldn't have crossed and so he wants samuel you go out here with me and offer a sacrifice so the people will still approve of me. They'll see you with me and think I'm still good to go. Mm-hmm. And I'll have their favor. I'll have their anointing. That's why we have, you know, a lot of times you'll have people, you see them in pulpits, that their primary reason for being in that pulpit, they, they 
I think on a, on a particular level, they want to please God. But it all becomes about, it's applause-centered ministry. And I think everybody will make a statement or two every now and then about, I wish somebody was hearing what I'm saying. And I think a lot of that's just sometimes it's just filler words. But there are some men that if 700 people are not running the aisle and 82 people didn't shake their hairpins out, which I'm on board with every bit of that. I, I want to see it every time we get together, truthfully. Sure. But sometimes the ministry that God's doing is going deep, not crazy. And there are men that they, they are there for the anointing of the people. They want the applause of the people. And no disrespect to anybody, but there is a particular pressure. If you travel full time or you're invited in, um, <laughs> your your expectations of being returned to that particular location are result-oriented. If there are no results, okay, well, then you have to go back and rephrase that. If the results are not what I want them to be, right. I'm not bringing you back. Sure. And so it's, again... What should the goal be? The will of God. We say stuff, I mean, we say crazy stuff like, uh, we have an unfettered pulpit. <laughs> but about 9.5% of the people that say that don't right. mean that. Yeah. That's just Pentecostal cliches. Right. And all it takes, you just go ahead and lay the thunder to something, and you find out whether that pulpit's fettered or not. Sure. Uh, I've had... I've had occasions to talk to different ones that have been brought in and been told in the office, you can preach about this, 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 and this, but this subject is off limits. Wow. Now, if someone told you that, what would you do? Leave. <laughs> <laughs> I, I thought you were going to say I'd preach on that subject. If the, <laughs> if the Lord required me to stay and didn't prevent me from it, I probably wouldn't be with it. I, I really like what you said about um, when it comes to the the growth, I'm paraphrasing because I don't know what word for word, but when you said uh, with growth, it's not just numerical. And I think people overlook that a lot because they see, oh, we have numbers, we have numbers, but there's no spiritual growth in that. So are you really getting a revival? Is that, I mean, I don't, that's a hard question. I don't really know how to. Yeah, every time I see something, it's all numbers, you know. Yeah. yeah. People are like, 20 well, we, got the Holy Ghost. Yeah. 20 got, got the Holy Ghost. Yeah. That's, that, the people treat it very numerical. Yeah. We all, I mean, it, it seems like a human response to it, too. Yeah. Or maybe it's an American thing. Well, all it, about the it numbers. <laughs> <laughs> it is, and it helps you stay booked up. Yep. It I gives mean, you, you goals. You think of if a brother goes online and says, praise be to God, I was in Mattoon, Illinois, and I drove 15 families out of the church today. <laughs> that don't tweet too well. That doesn't sound very good, does <laughs> it? No, that don't make a good Twitter post. No. No. But... You know, I mean, it's it comes down to, I think, what a person's hunger level is. Um, at lunch today, I made the statement that I'd, I've had the opportunity to be around multiple elders in my life. And one of the things that I've noticed about them that they all seem to have in common is, or was, most of them have passed on, was their hunger and their passion for the Lord. And to be in his presence. And and that they, and this isn't just a tag on to last night's service, but they didn't want to be anywhere he was not. Mm. And you, you see them getting all these invitations to go places, and everybody in the world knew them. Well, what was it everybody in the world knew about them? Most of the most, uh, let me rephrase that, a lot of the most spiritual People I know, people that we would use the term spiritual giants, are not necessarily going to be the ones that everybody wants to sit at the table with. We're going to want the people that preach all the general conferences, all the district conferences, all the camp meetings, all the whatevers, because they've learned how to. I'm going to really, y'all may not want this podcast podcasted live. <laughs> um, but they have figured out how to brand their ministries and promote themselves. And so we've got a generation of young men coming up and young women coming up. And, and my God, what, 
we, we've got these people that are wanting to be social influencers in the apostolic ranks. Have you lost your mind? Yeah. What in the world? And and I'm I'm grieved at the person that wants to be that, but the thing that really grieves me is is that they've got an audience yeah. in the apostolic church. But the real influencers and the real giants are the ones that you're going to find in a in a prayer room somewhere in a church at odd hours of the day and night. And the real spiritual people, they got scars, man. They they've got wounds. They they've got. They've been through hell that you you just can't even imagine. They they've which we all go through our trials, but these these people that have a true spiritual depth got it somewhere, and it wasn't it wasn't staying booked up, and it wasn't trying to keep your calendar full, and it wasn't trying to. It was, and I say this a lot, but there was a time in the church where God had to pull men out of the prayer room to take them to the pulpit. Hmm. Now we've got to force them pastors have to call their young men home and tell them, you come spend a few weeks in the prayer room. And so I think we've, you know, we've, again, a broken record here, but we've gotten good at doing what we do. We don't need God. And we've learned how to work the system. And But he did say, if my people pray, prayer is the basis of everything we do. Right, right. Yeah, on the on that subject of spiritual giants, um, and you know it's the old cliche. You know, back in our day, we had all this and that. <laughs> yeah, is that a you know? Do you see that those many people these days, or is it kind of a dying breed? Spiritual giants. I mean, sure, there's some, but I always hear, you know, back in the, you know what I'm saying, yeah, Patrick? Yeah, yeah. I remember being a kid and hearing like you know so everyone so hates millennials. So I mean, yeah. So <laughs> we're just gonna be the millennials that talk about <laughs> stuff. But like no, and uh, you know what the funny thing is, the people that hate millennials happen to be millennials yeah, in some way. Yeah. But anyways, that's another subject. But yeah, yeah I agree with you that. You see what I'm saying? Like, do you think that's still pretty prevalent, or are we losing that? We lost a generation of them, but in their shadow, God was grooming another generation. That would be. I'm not putting myself out there as one. I'm just saying. Men in my age bracket, 10 years. How old are you? 54. I'll be 55 in May. So men that are 10 to 15 years older than me are 10 years younger than me. That that 40 to 60 window. Mm-hmm. We grew up really in the shadow of those men. Now, you still got men like um, J.J. Bourne Sr., the old prophet and seer. woo um, Where is he from? Where is he, he pastor? Is, he pastored. He's pastored several churches in Texas and Mississippi. He travels full time now. Um, he lives in Houston. His son Romy Bourne pastors the church there now. And but Brother Bourne's like eighty-one years old, and he travels three hundred days a year and drives ninety-nine percent of it. Wow. Um, you talk about a man that is a giant in the church and in the kingdom. Oh dear God. Um, there's men like him that are still in that age group that are still among us, but they were never the ones that were advertised and branded. So nobody really, I say nobody, probably, probably the younger generation, 40 and under don't know who they are. Mm Mm-hmm. But then I don't don't know who that is. Yeah. I, I've, that's the first I've ever heard his name. Now now I want to look him up. (laughs) Oh yeah. You need to. He's, he's one of those that's just, uh, just. Uh, Brother Marvin Poole just passed a couple of years ago. He was one of those. Um, Sister Chenault just passed within the last five years, I think. Uh, she and Brother Chenault in Oklahoma were some of those. A lady named Sister Fraser, who went to, uh, she was attending, she was an old prophetess and seer. She blind. But, Brother, you hear me when I tell you, that woman walked with God and she they they'd bring people by her and she'd start praying for them and she couldn't see them mm-hmm. but she'd describe them describe their life minister to them it was absolutely amazing wow um she passed within the last 5 years but there are still some men and women in that age group in their 70s and 80s that are still among us um sister i think sister bobby wendell is still alive she's one of those um 
sister Vicky uh, Vernon. Yeah. Yeah. When um, she comes here. She's yeah. that woman's powerful. That's a prophetess right there. Oh yeah. Um, but then in my age group, there are men like uh, Brother uh, Ennis Fuller in Nacogdoches, Texas. Mm-hmm. Quiet, unassuming. But you hear me when I tell you something. You put a microphone in that man's hand, <laughs> the whole place is going to go up in smoke. He is one of the purest giftings of the evangelistic ministry and the fivefold giftings I've ever been around. One of the greatest apostolic teachers I know is Brother Jody Wells in um, Florida, um, David Wright in Maryland, a five-fold pastor. If there ever was one, it's him. And so there, there are men in that age bracket mm-hmm. that are there, and I think those are some of the ones that God has begun to call. And then younger even, I think, is the ones that's most significant uh, that the Lord will use to turn the world upside down with. Do you, do you feel like there's a the younger generation's doing a good job of trying to follow and pick up that mantle, I, or do they I, need to step it? Like, do you feel like they need to step it up a little bit? Or I well, it's kind of hard question to ask. But. Not really. I, I I think there's room for both of them. Sure. I think there's always room for all of us to step it up. Well, sure. Yeah. There's <laughs> always room for improvement. This I you could know? improve. I'll <laughs> tell you that. Um, but I, I have to tell you. I remember in in my years in the church hearing people talk about, oh, I'm concerned about the church, these young people today. Well, I got news for you. Mm -hmm. There's some pinheads, no doubt about it. Sure. Mm -hmm. But I'm going to tell you that young people, I'll even go to 16. 16 to 40 are hungrier for God than I personally have seen in a very, very long time. Uh, and I'm talking about an insane hunger for the things of God. I've been, I've, I volunteered to do it because there was a vacancy, and they didn't know what they were going to do. It just it happened so quick, and 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 I said, well, I'll do it uh, on an interim basis till y'all find somebody to take it. So on Wednesday nights when I'm home, my wife and I teach the uh, hyphen class in Fort Smith. Well, our first week there year and a half, almost two years ago, there wasn't but about four people in that class that were coming. Mm -hmm. And uh, the last two weeks, both weeks, we've had seven first-time guests. Between We've got between, if everybody's in there, some of them are doing various ministries around but on Wednesday nights, but if everybody was in there, there's probably close to 50 in there now. That's awesome. They will, it don't matter how deep you go teaching them, it don't matter if we start praying, and and we may go an hour and a half praying. They're right there. They they sit and take it in. Even these people that are, these kids that are coming, they're from the college or whatever. And we had three show up that didn't know anybody in the church, didn't know anything about that church, just showed up. They're hungry for something. And so I I really I really have a lot of optimism for where the church is headed because of where God's taken us, obviously. Sure. But also the young people in the church that are hungry. Now, I will tell you this. This generation got an iPhone. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you just go ahead and bore them. Get in the pulpit and preach some nonsense that bores them. They'll be on their phone. You start preaching stuff, and believe it or not, and I'm not trying to cross swords with anybody, <laughs> but I've had a lot of young adults come to me and tell me, could preachers please just quit preaching what's on the Internet and, and preach? That we can see that. Sure. We don't understand the Bible. What is prayer? Could somebody, but we're dialing all that back because we're trying to be, uh, you know, conscientious of our guests, but they came wanting what we are. Right. And so it just seems to me that young people... They're not going to put up with being lied to, I can tell you that. Yeah. If there's not more out there, quit telling us there is. And if there is more than what I've got, show me where it is and how do I get it. Right. Well, it's kind of like what what you said about those young men that were wanting to know how to do all those things. It's a perfect example. Absolutely. Absolutely. You keep hitting on the fivefold ministry. Um, You know, is that something that we're not doing as well on or throughout the church? 
Obviously, everything can be improved on, but you know, is that I something think we have failed utterly in in that area. If you just want me to be straight I'll, up honest, I want you to be straight up. Yes, I think we have just failed in regards to the fivefold ministry because we just want to we want to put three basic categories out there and we don't want to deal with the rest of it and i have a i have a feeling about why too that the enemy is doing that to us when and i may have said this here before but when they were building the tower of babel the lord knew the scripture indicates that he knew they were going to be successful so to stop what they were doing he changed how they talked about it. He didn't change the topic. He didn't, he didn't just come down and flatten the Tower of Babel and erase everybody's memories. He changed the language. So probably the Mandarin Chinese were still talking about the Tower of Babel, but the Arabs now couldn't understand them. Mm -hmm. and, and the folks that were headed to Guatemala and the Spanish-speaking nations of the world couldn't understand what the Arabs were saying. And the Japanese didn't know what nobody, and the Russians had no idea what in the wide world. He didn't stop them from having a conversation about the tower, but he changed how they talked about it. Because when you're not speaking the same language, you won't work together. You can't work together. Right. Communication's key and paramount to everything. And so <clears throat> I personally believe that Oh, Satan was standing there and watched all that get messed up. And he took note of it. He said, you know what? I'm going to take a play out of his playbook. And when, when scripture starts being fulfilled, that the latter house is going to be greater than the former. And the latter rain is going to be greater than the former rain. And the end time harvest that he's promised he's going to give the church. I'm going to use that plan right there to mess this thing up. This latter house, he tore up my house. I'm going to tear his up, and I'm going to use his playbook to do it. Well, the fivefold ministry, the Scripture says that he gave uh, the five. If you look it up, and I guess somebody, if one of y'all find that, where yeah. it's talking about the fivefold ministry, to some he gave apostles and to some prophets, pastors, teachers, and evangelists. And that's where we usually stop when we're talking about the fivefold ministry. We we want to we want to just read what they are, the identifiers of them, but we never go far enough to dwell on and talk about and teach and impart what the purpose of the five. What is the function of the fivefold ministry? When you get it, just start reading. Where, where what what scripture? Oh is it? goodness, I don't I'm know. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, you're fine. No, just type I'm, on the internet, fivefold ministry. Okay, I let it work. It'll come up. I'm so. <laughs> no, you're fine. You'd think I had it committed to memory. Well, you think I would too. <laughs> Ephesians four eleven. Yep, there it is. Let me get it pulled up here. Maybe. <laughs> Technology is uh, great when it works fast. <laughs> yeah, I'm in the Like I zone. said, we need a new PC. <laughs> All right, listen to this. Oh, you got it? Yeah. Okay. And he gave some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors, some teachers. That, wh that verse is usually where we stop. But here's why I did it. For the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry for the edifying of the body of Christ till we all come in the unity of faith. That's eternity. I was literally just reading about this and, and listening to another podcast about this, believe it or not. Like, it just now clicked in my head, you know, one of those aha moments. Yeah. Yes. So that's why I gave the fivefold ministry to the church. Not just for the edifying and the perfecting of the saints, but for the work of the ministry. There's nothing else that I'm aware of. Now, if y'all know, you show me because I don't want to be ignorant. But I don't know of another place in Scripture where anything else was given to the church for those three reasons, for edifying the church, perfecting the church, and preparing them and equipping them for the work of the ministry. 
So here we are now in the last 12 to 24 months, there has been just a deluge of conversations about the fivefold ministry. And everybody seems to be talking about it all the time, but it's babble all over again. Everybody's talking about it from their own perspectives and their own opinions. Well, I think, well, I don't think, well, if the Lord really wanted and blah, blah, blah. Bottom line is there's nowhere in scripture where he ever did away with the fivefold giftings. Nowhere. And if that reason that he gave them to the church has been fulfilled and completed, then sure, not just are two of them gone, apostles and prophets, they're all gone. Right. So that purpose is not finished. We're not all edified yet. We're not all perfected yet. Sure. And the work of the ministry still has to be done. Therefore, just that principle alone requires that the fivefold ministry must remain among us and must be widely accepted and promoted and made room for so that the body of Christ can be edified, perfected, and equipped for the end-time church and its mission in the harvest field. Now, if you can, if you anybody can say, okay, well, that purpose has been completed, then we're not the church either. Right, right, yeah. The, if, if we no longer need edification, perfecting, and equipping, then we're no longer the church. The church is finished. This is just some crazy thing, and we can start believing in the annihilation of the wicked dead that we'll live our life, we'll die, and that'll be the end of it. Right. But the work of the church still has to be done. So if the work of the church still has to be done, our, the way we do it and our ability to do it is still dependent on that right there. I've given you these five giftings so that you're edified, perfected, and able to do the job. You're equipped. And so, you know, again, when, when I, anybody calls me to talk about the fivefold ministry, that's where I go. Mm -hmm. If you can show me scripturally where the church don't exist, or the church still exists and is now so fully equipped and perfected that we no longer need this, just give me scripture for it. But because we're all human sitting in this room, mm -hmm. I don't know about the rest of you three brethren, but I still need help. <laughs> I definitely ain't I, I still, I'm just, you may say man of God, but Patrick's just Patrick's newly married. He needs a lot of oh, help. Oh, yeah, I need a lot of help. <laughs> My wife may agree with that. <laughs> <laughs> but if we're still flesh, we still need help. Right. I don't care how old or young we are. I still need a pastor in my life. I need spiritual authority over me, governing me. Right. And so if the church still exists, then we still need those, those giftings to perfect us because the rapture has not come and the work of the church still has to be done. And there is no other thing that I can find that he gave us to equip, perfect, and edify the body to do what it's called to do. So I don't know how we extrapolate any one of those giftings and get rid of it right. and say there's no need for it. He gave all that because he needed all that. And I got to, and I know, know you all probably on the clock, but. You're on the clock. We're good. We, got, <clears throat> yeah. we have all night, but yeah. you, have okay. a, you have to talk in 10 minutes. So Yeah. Well, I'm good to go. Whatever. <laughs> uh, I do. I'll hurry. But. The man Christ embodied all of this. But he said, you know what? I'm not going to leave one person with all this because I don't want one person to be an island to themselves. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to make them interdependent on one another. And I'm going to give this gift to this one and these over here and that over there. And the church will not look to any because if the church with its anointing, starts looking at one person who has all of this stuff and they're the only one that's got it, we'll make a God out of them. Yeah. Right. So he said, we're not going to do that. You're going to need multiple people. And some of them are going to be people you never, never imagined would be the ones you needed. So, yeah, I think we have dropped the ball on the five-fold ministry. Which is crazy because I remember being a kid, I felt like we heard a lot about it. I mean, I don't know if you A little did. bit more, yeah. Yeah. But, yeah, I haven't really heard much about it in a long time. Yeah. Well, I hate to, to stop. we got a lot more to talk about, but um, you'll be here for 217 next year, right? Yeah. That's probably the next time we'll see each other. And the upcoming celebration. Yes. In April. Oh, okay. Oh, you're going to be back in April? Yeah. Oh, yeah. How long are you going to be here for? Oh, I'll, I don't know. I've got to be here for that great Well, I'll text you. Celebratory Maybe we can time. do it again. If you, I'll be if glad you, to. Okay, good. Yes, we'll we'll do it again having, in April then. Yeah, absolutely. I, I enjoy having you on. This is For me, this is the second time I've had you on the podcast. Yeah. So, 
All yeah, right. we'll do it. Well, we want to thank you all for watching. Uh, if you enjoy it, please leave a please leave a like and a comment. And God bless you.